Order it being 2 p.m. The debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. And I ask, will the Prime Minister advise the House of his relationship with Beijing Ostchina Technology? including their sponsorship of his round-the-world trip in 2006 and the reasons for that sponsorship. The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. When the honourable member came into the chamber a couple of days ago, he as asserted from the uh, floor of the parliament that I had accompanied this company uh, to Sudan. That was untrue. Uh, he asserted further that I had made commercial representations in Sudan on behalf of this company. That was untrue. I've made it very clear in my public comments that I've known uh, Mr Ian Tang of this company for two or three years, several years, um, and um, all travel which Mr Tang, has, uh, Mr Tang and his company has uh, supported of mine has been fully declared, as has been that of my colleagues, on the pecuniary interest register. Yeah, yeah. And coming from opposition, I simply make this point. In opposition, as uh, Shadow Foreign Minister for five years and Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade for a further year, there was no budget allocated for travel. We were required to depend on private sponsorship for overseas travel. And perhaps it's one of these things we should look at in the future in terms of how it might be changed. The member for Melbourne Ports. Thank you, Speaker. My question uh, is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform the House uh, of the impact of the abolition of Australian workplace agreements on working families? Prime Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Melbourne Ports for his question. Today, in this parliament, we have declared dead and buried Australian workplace agreements. Yeah. We have declared dead and buried in this parliament a set of industrial laws which made possible for workplace agreements to strip working families of basic wages and conditions. Our attitude, that which we took to the election last time, was that AWAs had to be scrapped, lock, stock and barrel, and that is what the legislation which has been put through this parliament by the Deputy Prime Minister has done. If you look at the AWAs that we have got rid of, these are the AWAs that required longer work hours and paid less per hour than collective agreements. These are the AWAs that in their thousands and tens of thousands have taken hundreds of thousands of dollars away out of the, out of the pay packets of working men and women. AWAs that stripped away rest breaks, penalty rates, overtime pay, shift loadings. AWAs that, according to the Bureau of Statistics, made workers endure industrial arrangements which had them take away on average $87 per week out of their pay packets of women compared to collective agreements. And these are the AWAs and the industrial relations regime which those opposite were so proud to support. On our side of the chamber, we stand proudly by the fact that in this legislation we have honoured to the letter what we committed to the Australian people before the election. We have honoured to the letter the abolition of AWAs. We have honoured to the letter our commitment to Australian working families to construct in their place a decent, fair and balanced set of industrial relations arrangements for the future. Decency in the Australian way of life means that everyone in the workplace gets a fair go, not just some. And when we look to the future, I find it therefore extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, that on this day, when we declared dead and buried Australian workplace agreements, when put to a vote in this parliament and a motion just before question time, those opposite could not bring themselves to support this part of the motion. And it reads as follows, in order to ensure the decent and fair treatment of Australian working families, that statutory individual employment agreements should never again be reintroduced into Australian workplace relations laws. And the Liberal Party and the National Party of Australia oppose that. The Liberal Party and the National Party are therefore saying to the nation at large they hold open the prospect, the intention to reintroduce AWAs should they ever regain the Treasury benches. We on this side of the chamber have made it clear prior to the election our commitment to abolish AWAs. The Liberal Party and the National Party have made it clear today their intention to reintroduce AWAs. Order. Before calling the member for Goldstein, I inform the House we have present in the gallery this afternoon a former Speaker of the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, the Honourable John Murray. In, a, in addition, we have John Thwaites, a former Deputy Premier of Victoria. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, my question again is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he has met Mr. Ian Tang, Chief Executive Officer of Beijing AusChina Technology, in the last few months? Prime Minister, what was discussed in those meetings? Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said in a press conference earlier today, I met Mr. Tang uh, sometime in November and December for 10 or 15 minutes for a cup of coffee in Brisbane. The nature of the conversation was, hello, how are you? Haven't seen you for a bit. Um, and uh, it's true. And um, I'd be very interested, given the, the I'd be very interested, given the level of interest, very interested, given the uh, level of interest on the part of those uh, on on the part of those uh, on the part of those opposite. Given that this company, which the opposition now has great concerns about, which has contributed, I misled the House the other day, not $100,000 but $150,000 to the National Party, if there is a concern about this, what discussions occurred between this company and the former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, other senior National Party ministers or others? What was the content of those? If there is a concern about the, the nature of this company or its relationship with members of parliament, I'd be very interested Order. to know from the Shadow Foreign Minister whether there are concerns on that Order. department given the nature of the financial support by the company and concern to the, um, uh, to the National Party. All these facts on the part of myself and my colleagues are declared fully on the pecuniary interest register. The member for Parramatta. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Is the minister aware of support for the reintroduction of Australian workplace agreements? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Parramatta for her question. Uh, can I say, Mr Speaker, that today has truly been an important day in the workplace relations history of this country. Yeah. Today, this parliament passed Labor's transition to forward with fairness bill. This is the beginning of getting rid of work choices. This is taking handfuls of dirt and throwing it in the grave of work choices because we want to bury it. And from the coming into operation of Labor's new laws, there won't be a working Australian who, under Labor, has to fear that they will walk into a workplace, workplace only to be confronted with an Australian workplace agreement which strips away basic c conditions, basic pay and conditions matters for no compensation or no proper compensation. And of course, that was the essence of work choices. The essence of work choices was Australian workplace agreements and the ability to strip the safety net away. And when the Labor's fair, balanced and flexible system is in full operation on 1 January 2010, there will be no new statutory individual employment agreements of any nature. There will be a safety net on which working Australians can stand, and standing on that safety net, they will then be able to bargain with their employer, either collectively or for a common law contract, but a common law contract that always must give them the safety net. Now, working Australians are entitled to know whether this reprieve from Australian workplace agreements and work choices is enduring or whether it is the policy of the Liberal Party that, should they ever resume government, they will reintroduce Australian workplace agreements and work choices. And this was the simple question that they always refused to answer. In their rhetoric about not supporting whilst not opposing Labor's legislation, they never answered that simple question. What do they stand for? Do they stand, if re-elected to government, for the reintroduction of work choices and Australian workplace agreements, or if they finally heard the voice of the Australian people, and are they truly going to respect it, as the Leader of the Opposition suggested yesterday? And we needed to know the answer to this question because working Australians are entitled to it. And working Australians know that the Liberal Party is a political party with a track record of deceit on workplace relations, a track record of going to an election and deceiving working Australians about their intention after the election. That's what they did in 2004. Australians are entitled to know. Well, Mr Speaker, today we got the answer. Indeed, we got 62 answers from those that sit opposite. 
today when asked to vote whether or not they were planning to introduce new statutory individual employment agreements, they revealed their hand. We put to them a very simple proposition. Would you agree with us that never again will we see in this country the reintroduction of individual statutory employment agreements? Will you agree with us never again to reintroduce Australian workplace agreements? Will you agree with us to never again reintroduce work choices? And they voted no. And they voted no. We now have the Liberal Party's policy revealed. Should they ever become the government again, then they will reintroduce Australian workplace agreements. They will reintroduce work choices. We flush them out. We know they were running up and down the corridors trying to work out how they were going to vote, that they played all sorts of procedural tricks in this parliament to give them the maximum amount of time to work out how they were going to vote. But ultimately, they voted for the reintroduction of work choices. And that's all any Australian will ever need to know about the values of the Leader of the Opposition and the party he leads. Everything working Australians need to know about the Liberal Party has been revealed today. Today, the Liberal Party had the, today, the, Liberal Party had the opportunity to put its signature on the death certificate of work choices. And instead of doing that, they sought to revive it, and Australians will judge them on that. Yeah. Order, because, before calling the member for Goldstein, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon members of a parliamentary delegation from the Republic of Lithuania, Lietjeva Labus. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Will the Minister confirm that he was accompanied by a staff member on his five trips to China that were paid for by Beijing AusChina Technology? And given the Minister outlined only three individual meetings from his 33 days overseas, will the Minister advise the House the circumstance in which the sponsorship arose? The Minister's understanding of the reasons for Beijing AusChina's technology providing this sponsorship, what meetings were held, who attended these meetings and the subject of matters of, that were discussed. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. I'd remind, I'd remind the honourable member of the answer I gave yesterday, of the further information that I've put out there in the papers this morning. Uh, I'd also remind him of the fact that the information that he's then raised there again today, the reason that he's got that about the staff member is because it too was on the public register. It was put there on the time. Uh, a staff member didn't accompany me on every trip, uh, and the register shows which ones the staff member accompanied with me and when they didn't. The member for Wills. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Uh, what steps is the government taking to improve the management of discretionary grants, and how will improving the grant system help in the government's fight against inflation and rising interest rates? The Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Wills for his question. Inflation is now at 3.6%, and that's been putting upward pressure on interest rates. And the government is committed to clamping down on government spending, which is rising at 4.5 per cent in real terms, and getting better value for money out of Australian taxpayers' dollars and greater efficiency in government spending. One particular area that we are committed to doing this, Mr Speaker, is with respect to individual grants or discretionary grants that are made by the government to individual organisations for a variety of purposes. And recently, my department gave me some data on developments in that area of discretionary grants, and it makes very interesting reading. In 2000, the then Liberal government handed out a, a total of 3,941 discretionary grants at a cost of $579 million. 2002, the figure was 6,141 grants at a cost of $451 million. The number of grants went up, the amount of money went down. By 2006, these figures had gone up to 14,539 grants at a total cost to the taxpayer of slightly over $2.7 billion. And in 2007, last year, the number leapt 
dramatically to 49,060 grants at a total cost to the taxpayer of over $4.5 billion. So within the space of five years, the total amount of money being spent by the Australian government on discretionary grants had multiplied tenfold, multiplied tenfold from $450 odd million to $4.5 billion. And it, the, increase alone, the increase alone in the amount of money involved in 2007, last year, the election year, was 67 per cent. It's also worth noting, Mr Speaker, that of the 49,000 individual grants handed out by the former Liberal government last year, 30,700 of these grants were for figures below $5,000. And indeed, when you look at the list of the smallest grants, it's an interesting picture. The smallest grant, the smallest individual grant handed out by the Howard government last year was for the grand total sum of $70. Now that is not a unique figure by any means, Mr Speaker, because when you look at the list from smallest upwards, the next largest is $79, then there's an $85 one, another $85 one, a $90 grant, a $96 grant and a $98 grant. There is a very long list of very, very small grants. That explains why there are 30-odd thousand of them under $5,000 and why such a huge leap had occurred. My department advises Mr. Speaker, that the cost of administering many of these grants would have been significantly higher than the actual amount of the grant itself. It also advises that the cost of $4.5 billion to the taxpayer, of course, does not include the cost of administering the grant, which perhaps explains the blowout in the total cost of government and the size of the public service over the past few years. It also advises that many agencies are failing to use the central register of discretionary grants to ensure that we don't get double dipping, that you don't get individual grant recipients get doubling up on grants. And it also advises that we have over 150 separate grant processing IT systems in the Commonwealth at present. Now, many of these grants are worthwhile, Mr. Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker. However, however, there are a few that are a little bit Order. dodgy. For example, the rainmaker, the member for Wentworth, who had a recommendation of $2 million on a grant for a bit of cloud seeding, a bit of cloud seeding, and he decided that he'd make that a $10 million grant. Or for cheese factories that get money after they've closed their doors, or railways, Order. historic railways where no trains run, or ethanol plants that never produce any ethanol, and the list goes on. The list just goes on. The former Liberal government converted the Australian government into a giant vote-buying machine, Mr Speaker. It presided over an appalling misuse of Australian taxpayers' money. And this government, the Rudd government, is committed to introducing strict rules to ensure that we get genuine benefit for taxpayers from the application of these grants, that they are handled in a proper and prudent way. The rules we've already introduced include no minister can make a decision about a grant that applies in his or her own electorate. No minister can make a decision about a grant without getting departmental advice, and no minister can unilaterally override departmental advice, and ministers are required to announce decisions on grants promptly. We have a detailed further review underway to analyse all aspects of delivery of discretionary grants to ensure that the taxpayer gets value for money, that there is genuine probity and accountability, and that we ensure that, in overall terms, the value that is delivered to the Australian economy and Australian society justifies the amount of money that's spent. The reason for this is simple, Mr Speaker, because the Rudd Labor government is committed to delivering value for money for Australian taxpayers, greater efficiency with the way the government spend its, spends its money, greater benefit to the Australian community, because we understand that of that $4.5 billion, every last dollar of that is coming from some working family's budget. And we have a very serious obligation as a government to ensure that it is not frittered away in the way that the former government did. The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer to the Treasurer's disclosure of two trips totalling eight days in 2006 and 2007, paid for by Beijing Ostchina Technology. Given the failure of the Minister for Agriculture to provide key information to the House, Will the Treasurer advise the House the circumstances in which the sponsorship arose, 
the Treasurer's understanding of the reasons for Beijing AusChina Technology providing this sponsorship, what meetings were held, who attended and the subject matters discussed. The Treasurer. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. I have travelled overseas in both my capacity as a member of parliament but also as shadow treasurer on numerous occasions in the three years leading up to now. Because, as the member is very well aware, the monies available to shadow ministers are not great for international travel. We just have the basic entitlement that uh, every member of parliament has for one three-year period. So if you want to do your job as a shadow minister, if you want to get out there into the big wide world, whether it's going to the United States, whether it's going to China or whether it's going to Britain, then you have to have some assistance. I, uh, I met this company some time ago. They did sponsor some of my travel. All of that has been disclosed. All of it has been disclosed. And when I was travelling, I was doing my job as both a member of parliament and as a shadow minister. And given the importance of China to the economy of this country, that's what I should have been doing. And all of those matters have been disclosed. If the member's got some allegation to make, let him make it and let him come clean on all the sponsored travel on the other side of the House. The member for Blacksland. Put up or shut up. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Can the minister outline any current support for work choices from members of this House? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much. And I thank the member for his question and I know his deep concern for the working families in his electorate who don't want work choices. Mr Speaker, we have seen the opposition today vote in favour of the continuation of work choices. And people might find it hard to imagine how can you come into the parliament and do that and at the same time say, as the Leader of the Opposition does, that you respect the views of the Australian community who voted against work choices at the last election. What chain of reasoning puts these two things together? What would you have to believe in order to conduct yourself like that? Well, Mr Speaker, fortunately we know what the opposition believes and we've got a very good source for knowing what it believes, and that source is the member for Warringah, one of the most senior members of the opposition formerly one of the most senior members of the Howard government, having served in this place as Leader of the House and Minister for Health and in other capacities. And the member for Warringah was asked today at a press conference whether the bill that bans AWAs passed in the Senate last night, referring to that, is Australia today a better place? And he said, well, Australia will be over time a different place as a result of the change of government. But he went on to say, and this is the important quote, so the Howard government's industrial legislation, it was good for wages, it was good for jobs, and it was good for workers. And let's never forget that. The member for Warringah, on behalf of the opposition, one of its most senior members, saying, so the Howard government's industrial legislation, it was good for wages, it was good for jobs and it was good for workers, and let's never forget that. The political party of work choices speaks. It has so lost touch with the Australian community, it believes that work choices was good for workers. The Liberal Party has so lost touch with ordinary working Australians, it believes work choices was good for workers. Well, I'd ask the member for Warringah and the member who's interjecting, the member for Mayo and the rest of the opposition who today have voted for work choices and described it as good for workers, to explain to the 70 per cent of workers who lost their shift loadings in AWAs whether it was good for them, to the 65 per cent of workers who lost their penalty rates through AWAs whether it was good for them. For the 61% uh, who lost their days substituted for public holidays, was it good for them? Was it good for the 50% of people on Australian workplace agreements who lo lost public holiday pay? Was it good for the 31% that lost rest breaks? And of course, the statistics of shame that relate to work choices go on. They are just the start of the statistics. 
Does the Leader of the Opposition agree it was good for workers for them to lose amounts of up to $500 a week, as I have disclosed in this House? Was that good for workers? Is that what you mean by good for workers in the Liberal Deputy Party Prime these days? Marks through the, chair. the, the uh, view of the Liberal Party of this country is that work choices was good for workers. Every statement they've made since the election about work choices being dead, about respecting the decision of the Australian people, about listening to their voice, about having a changed view, every statement made by any member of the opposition since the election was a false statement. They've shown it today by how they voted to continue work choices. The member for Warringah has helpfully laid bare for every working Australian to see they believe being able to be ripped off is good for workers. They believe being able to be sacked for no reason and with no remedy is good for workers. This is a political party that has lost touch and lost its way and understands nothing about the circumstances of working Australians. And as we've seen from today's vote and today's statement by the member for Warringah, they never will. Order the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I refer to the Minister's disclosure of vehicle transport, meals and hospitality paid for by Beijing AusChina Technology when he visited China in 2005. As the previous two ministers have failed to answer their questions, will the Minister advise the House the circumstances in which this hospitality arose? and the Minister's understanding of the reasons for Beijing AusChina technology providing this hospitality. Will the Minister advise the House if any meetings were held with Beijing AusChina technology, and if so, who attended these meetings and the subject matters discussed? The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his uh, question. I can confirm that uh, I travelled to China from the 28th of March to the 3rd of April 2005, while I was Shadow Minister for Industry, Infrastructure and Industrial Relations. In accordance with the procedures which bind all members of this House, I declared that travel in the Register of Parliamentary Interests. That has been a matter of public record since May 2005. While I was in China, I visited uh, Guangdong Province, Guangzhou, Beijing and Shanghai. I've also declared on uh, that, uh, that parliamentary register, which has been there since May 2005, that as part of that trip I received hospitality and other uh, service provisions from Beijing, uh, Australia, Be Beijing Aus Australia Technology. That's been declared. I also received a gift of a Chinese tea set, which has been declared. Whilst I was in China, I had a meeting with Mr Ian Tang where we discussed matters about China and Australia and the important economic relationship between our two nations. Since that time, uh, I've had, I think, uh, one meeting with Mr Tang when he came to Canberra, and it was a short meeting where we wished, e wished each other well. <laughs> Mr. Tang, Mr Tang requested to see me uh, at the beginning of this year or late last year uh, upon my becoming Minister for Foreign Affairs. I was happy to see him. In the event I wasn't available to see him at the required time, I saw nothing, I saw nothing, nothing inappropriate uh, with that meeting. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as the Treasurer has made clear, uh, any number of our member, members in this place, on your side or on this side, have been the recipients of sponsored travel. The important thing here is this. Firstly, was that sponsored travel declared? In my case, it was, and it's been there on the public record since May 2005. If the member is making any suggestions of impropriety or any allegations, just make them. Just make them. Just make them. And you might also, if you propose to make any such baseless allegations, cough up on all the sponsored travel on your side. I remind the minister for the need to address his remarks through the chair. The member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer explain what the government is doing to make sure working families are looked after as we begin tackling climate change? The Treasurer. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the member for his question because the government understands that the cost of inaction on climate change is greater than the cost of action for all Australians. And that's why the guiding principle for the government's response to climate change is least cost. We are deeply committed to addressing climate change by reducing domestic emissions at the very lowest cost that is possible. And I think most Australians will appreciate that the costs of climate change in action are far greater than the cost of action. Of course, this was acknowledged, Mr Speaker, even by the former Prime Minister, who is a climate change sceptic. He said reducing carbon emissions will mean higher energy and petrol prices. Australians need to understand that. Well, Mr Speaker, when it comes to climate change, we on this side of the House will look after working families, and we will provide the leadership and the foresight that is required to deal with this, to deal with it properly by bringing in an emissions trading system, which is so terribly important in terms of business investment, but to deal with this problem in the long term. And that's why the government was so pleased that the Minister for Climate Change was able to publish her timetable for the development of an emissions trading system. We support a comprehensive response which protects the interests of working families. The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister disclose details to this House of all meetings and conversations that have occurred since the election between his ministers and Beijing AusChina Technology, including with Chief Executive Officer Mr Ian Tang? Prime Minister. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, the uh, ministers who have answered questions from the member today have responded to this point, uh, as I have myself. If the, if the honourable member has any substantive allegations to make, he should make them. The member for Blair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Will the minister please outline to the House changes to the defence leadership team, what will be their key priorities? and what new measures the government will take to support the service chiefs. The Minister for Defence. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Blair for his question. His electorate, of course, is home to Ambly Rough Base, and naturally, therefore, he has a deep-seated interest and is very active in the area of defence policy. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning the Prime Minister and I had the pleasure of announcing that Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston will be reappointed as Chief of the Defence Force. We were also pleased to announce a number of other senior military appointments. Lieutenant General David Hurley will be appointed as the new Vice Chief of the Defence Force. Rear Admiral Russell Crane will be appointed as the new Chief of Navy. Lieutenant General Ken Gillespie will be appointed as the new Chief of Army. And Air Chief Marshal Mark Binskin will be appointed as the new Chief of Air Force. All very fine appointments, Mr Speaker, I know the House will agree, and I wish them all well and acknowledge in this place the very fine work of those people who they will replace. Mr Speaker, the single biggest challenge facing the Australian Defence Force is its people and skills shortage. This will be a key focus for the new service chiefs. I am tasking this new defence leadership team with an increased emphasis on one of their existing responsibilities. In addition to training and sustaining their respective services, each service chief will be directly responsible for ensuring that sufficient trained and skilled personnel are available. Every three months, or more often if necessary, the service chiefs will spell out in detail the progress they have made in meeting the exacting requirements of their respective services for skilled trades and professions. This is a tough challenge they face in an era of almost full employment and at a time when the mining industry is booming. But succeed, Mr Speaker, we must. Our people challenge is just one the new government has inherited in the defence portfolio. The defence budget is in a mess and many of the capability projects we have inherited are in crisis. The cost of sustaining capability has been alarmingly underestimated and underfunded. The Howard government has been committing to new capital, uh, capital projects without taking proper account of their ongoing funding requirements. It's like, as I said in a speech last night, Mr. Speaker, it's like factoring into the family budget the cost of a new car, but not accounting in that same budget 
for the fuel, the insurance, the red jail and the maintenance, or in the case of the member for Wentworth, the chauffeur. The government remains committed to growing the defence budget by 3 per cent real out to 2016. Order. This is a big Order. call, given the inflationary environment we have inherited from the former government. But it will do so because, as the Prime Minister says, it is core business for any government. But given the mess we have inherited from the former government, we will need 3 per cent real growth and more. The waste and mismanagement in defence procurement must end and internal efficiencies will need to be found so that the money saved can be reinvested into defence. Every dollar spent in one area of defence capability is a dollar not available to be spent in another. We have an obligation to get it right. We can't afford, Mr Speaker, to waste a cent. Labor is determined to clean up the mess we've inherited from the now Leader of the Opposition, who was gambling not only with taxpayers' money but, indeed, with national security. In partnership with our new leadership team, the government is determined to put the defence ba budget back on track. We will, we will fill that $6 billion hole we've been left with in net personal and operating costs. We'll put the defence procurement system back on track and we'll develop a plan to address defence's people and skills shortage. The member for Goldstein. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Finance representing the Minister for Superannuation. Can the Minister for Finance confirm that the Australian arm of Beijing AusChina Technology is a $1 company and that its principal place of business is this suburban house in the Sydney suburb of Warrywood? Will the Assistant Treasurer disclose all information held will the Minister for Finance disclose all information held by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission on AusChina technology, including its relationship with the Chinese parent company. The Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker, and uh, I thank the honourable member for his question. No, I can't confirm any of those matters. I'm happy to refer them to the Minister for Corporate Law and Superannuation for further advice. The Leader of the Opposition with a Point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. If the Minister could report that information to the House, please. <laughs> the member for Bendigo. I have a question for the Prime Minister, and I ask, will the Prime Minister update the House on progress relating to the Council of Australian Governments? Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. The Council of Australian Governments uh, languished uh, under our predecessors. It has been in the past a core vehicle for national microeconomic reform. last 12 years it languished and, in effect, did very little. Our intention as a government, reflected in the pre-election commitments we made to fix the Federation, is to put COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, back into centre space, when, centre, the centre stage when it comes to delivering effective long-term microeconomic reform. If you are looking at the overall challenges of productivity growth, what do we invest in terms of human capital, what we invest in infrastructure, what we do on the deregulation front. So much of that is bound up with the actual state of our federation. And the federation has become somewhat sick in recent years. Functional duplication and overlap, a plethora of regulatory regimes which affect uh, businesses trying to go out there and earn a living, as well as the impact on working families as they seek to deal with various le levels of government to consume basic health, education and other services. At the uh, end of last year, within uh, six weeks or so of the government taking office, we convened the first meeting of the Council of Australian Governments since the new government has assumed office. We outlined a comprehensive program of action for the year 2008, covering education, covering health, covering business deregulation, climate change, water and the rest. Important because if you are going to achieve real outcomes for the nation, you need to work in cooperation with the states and territories. If you simply want someone to blame on the way through, then you play a political tactic as our predecessors did for 12 years. Because COAG is either a vehicle for change or it is an alibi for inaction. And our predecessors demonstrated a strong predilection for the latter. When it comes to the upcoming COAG, which will be held in Adelaide at the end of next week, we have a substantial agenda of work uh, on, our, on our plate. 
and we intend to work methodically, carefully, uh, with uh, diligence through the agenda of microeconomic reform, which we have put to the Australian people. One of the areas where the Commonwealth and the states can work better together is in dealing with a challenge which was uh, the subject of a question in this place yesterday. And I go to the whole challenge again of homelessness. This is an important matter. All families across the country are concerned about housing affordability. Many families across the, family are across the country are concerned about homelessness. And after 16 years of economic growth, it's unacceptable that any given night we have 100,000 Australians who are homeless and, on average, between 10 to 14,000 who are sleeping rough. Before the election, we committed to halve the number of people turned away from crisis accommodation within five years. That's a very big commitment. We committed to a policy called a place to call home, which is a $150 million investment to build or purchase 600 new homes for people in crisis accommodation. And today in the parliament, I'm pleased to confirm that we've reached agreement with the state and territory governments on the implementation of this election commitment. For the first time, the new accommodation will be delivered in those areas where homelessness, homelessness problems is most acute, and the funding will now start to flow. This scheme will provide a permanent home so that families will no longer have to uproot and move from crisis accommodation to crisis accommodation. One of the great uh, feedbacks we've got from the community sector on this, reflected in the discussion we had as a parliamentary party yesterday, is that when someone goes into crisis accommodation, within a short period of time they're often relocated to crisis accommodation or transitional accommodation elsewhere, which means that kids have to be ripped out of school, which means their school performance goes through the floor, and which that in turn creates a whole series of other problems as well. What we are seeking to move towards is a situation and a set of policies and programs across the country where we deal with the homelessness challenge in situ, so that when we relocate someone to a, a uh, crisis accommodation centre that, or a crisis accommodation home or rented apartment, that that has a reasonable prospect of being their long-term place to live. This is a first step, and I emphasise a first step in this government's new approach to homelessness which also includes our commitment to deliver the first white paper of this government, which will set out a comprehensive plan of action for the decade ahead. Mr Speaker, we believe on this side of the parliament in putting an end to the blame game. Yeah. Homelessness, homelessness, homelessness is about decency. I find it remarkable that those opposite laugh about homelessness. I find it remarkable that they laugh about homelessness. I would have thought a mark of basic decency Order. is a program of action to deal with homelessness. Order. Because it may be of surprise to many of those opposite that there are homelessness crises and problems and challenges in each of their electorates. That may be invisible to them. It is not invisible to the government. We intend to prosecute a program of action to deal with this challenge and rather than just blame state and territory governments to decide that we have a cooperative program of action with the states and territories to enable people who find themselves in these desperate circumstances to at least have that level of basic human decency and support. The member for Goldstein. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, do you think there's anything unusual about the Labor Party accepting $170,000 in donations, 16 trips for himself, members of his Order. parliamentary party and the staff? The member for Goldstein will resume his place. The Leader of the House at the point of order. Point of order. Um, understanding orders, questions can't ask for an opinion. The Shadow Minister obviously began his question asking for an opinion. Well, that, no, no. He has the, the, the structure of that first part of the uh, question is out of order, but I'll listen to the rest of the question. But the, the, minister, the member should understand that the, the wording as it stands is out of order. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Goldstein. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister explain? that there is anything unusual about the Labor Party accepting $170,000 in donations, 16 trips for himself, members of his parliamentary party and staff, from a Chinese company whose principal place of business in Australia is a Sydney suburban home in Warrywood. The Prime Minister. The key consideration here, Mr Speaker, is whether all supported travel has been declared. It has been. 
the key, the key consideration here is whether all political donations have been properly uh, registered with the relevant political party. My understanding is they have been with the Labor Party, as I understand they have been with the National Party. At least I hope so. The member for Bonner. Yes, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. Will the Minister inform the House of the progress made in the COEG Housing Working Group to address housing affordability and homelessness? The Minister for Housing. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Bonner for her question. We know that housing affordability in Australia is at an all-time low, and we had more figures yesterday from AMP and Natsem showing that 62 per cent of first home buyers are now in housing stress. And at, the, at the other end, we've got more older people also in housing stress. The number of older Australians in their housing stress has doubled, according to this report. There was a COAG working group on housing established um, by COAG in the, uh, December 2007 to develop implementation plans for the housing affordability policies that Labor took to the last election. The Housing Affordability Fund, that half million dollar fund to bring down the cost of building new homes, the National Rental Affordability Scheme, initially a program to uh, support the building of 50,000 new affordable rental properties, now 100,000 affordable rental properties, our 600 new homes for the homeless, a place to call home, and that new innovative approach of leaving people in place and moving services around them rather than forcing homeless families to move from pillar to post, our National Housing Supply Council to make sure that the dire straits we find ourselves now in when it comes to housing affordability uh, uh, don't reoccur in the future, and our proposal to um, release surplus Commonwealth land for housing and for other uh, community uses. That housing working group established by COAG uh, I am very pleased to chair. It has representatives of central agencies from states and, of course, of housing departments from states. And I'm very happy to be able to report that those implementation plans are ready and those policies are ready to roll. Of course, um, that's not the end of the challenge. We don't imagine for a moment that the work on housing affordability is complete. After 12 years of substantial neglect in this area, we've got, a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of problems to overcome. We know that demand began to outstrip supply seriously in 2004. We saw this semi-trailer hurtling down the highway at us as a nation and never lifted a finger. The previous government never lifted a finger to address some of the issues that were contributing to the shortfall of housing that we now face. The reason housing is so unaffordable, rental housing in particular, is because we have a serious supply problem, a supply problem that we saw coming and that the previous government did nothing about. The COAG implementation plans, when agreed, will see uh, these policies, as I say, ready to roll, and we'll also see our first home saver accounts ready to roll. They'll be available in the second half of this year. Um, local government will be able to uh, look, at the, look to the Housing Affordability Fund for help to uh, bring more affordable blocks of land onto the market, to uh, use the Housing Affordability Fund to support the rollout of e-processing, um, development application processing to reduce the holding costs of land. Um, the applications for the National Rental Affordability Scheme will open in June, July this year, and we will see the first 3,500 uh, um, uh, incentives available in the next financial year. And the building of new homes for the homeless will start within months. The government has agreed an agenda with the states and territories in three and a half months that the previous government was not able to come to in 12 years. In fact, um, I'd say that a large part of the reason for that is because we had no real understanding or interest from the previous government um, when it came to housing affordability and, indeed, when it came to homelessness. This morning we heard the member for Warringah criticising Labor members of parliament for visiting homeless services. Of course, why would you talk to Mission Australia about homelessness or St Vincent de Paul or the Salvation Army or Wesley? Why would you talk to any of these people about homelessness or indeed any of the people living in those shelters who have the first-hand experience of becoming homeless and living as homeless people in our community? 
Why on earth would you talk to those people, Member for Warringah? You know what? We have committed $150 million already to building new homes for the homeless. We have committed to extra support for organisations like RecLink that engage homeless people uh, with support services and are the, the, the uh, um, originators of the choir of hard knocks. Any of this could have been done in the previous 12 years of the previous government. There was no action. After uh, 16 years of record growth, we saw record numbers of homeless people and record numbers of homeless families with children. I'm very pleased to be able to report to the House and to my Labor colleagues that our implementation plans uh, 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 worked on by the COAG Working Group on Housing are proceeding apace and that COAG has become a real vehicle for change, not an excuse for inaction. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. Given the Prime Minister has already spent 10 days overseas in his first four months in office and is due to leave for an 18-day trip, including four days in China, why is the Prime Minister not spending even one hour in Japan, Australia's largest export market? Prime Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome the question from the Leader of the Opposition. I would have thought the first responsibility of a government of whichever political persuasion is to ensure that our principal foreign relationships are in good working order. Therefore, one of the first decisions undertaken by this government within a week or so of taking office was to travel to Indonesia for what purpose? To ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Something which I seem to recall it took you a long, long time not to do. The second decision that uh, the government took was that it was important to visit, new, uh, to, uh, visit East Timor, to visit Dili, because uh, uh, when it came to the challenges to security in that country and the further deployment of um, military personnel and police personnel, it was absolutely the responsible thing to do to assist our nearest neighbour in need. That's the second time. Then, when it came to uh, the neighbourhood, uh, which uh, the uh, honourable member for Mayo displayed such comprehensive lack of interest in for the last decade or so, that is the South Pacific, the state of our relationship with uh, Papua New Guinea. Prime Minister has the call. And I could report to the honourable member for Mayo that he's missed deeply across the South Pacific. They uh, were constantly inquiring after the honourable member's well-being. Uh, when you have our, our nearest neighbour to our north, Papua New Guinea, where we arrived at an extraordinarily unsustainable situation of a ban on ministerial contact between Australian government ministers and Papua New Guinea to our north, and that ban had proceeded for virtually a year, it's not the way in which this government proposes to do business with its neighbours. And the purpose of a visit to Papua New Guinea and to Garoka and to the Solomons, where we have still some several hundred troops and police deployed, uh, was to rebuild bridges with our principal partners within the South Pacific and also to look firsthand at what was necessary to deal with the challenges of development in the South Pacific, where most of the development indicators are headed in the reverse direction. That answers the first part of the question in terms of what official travel has been engaged in on the part of uh, myself as Prime Minister since the change of government. Secondly, um, secondly as far as uh, the upcoming travel is concerned, as soon as I became Prime Minister, the Ambassador of the United States came to see me and said that the President would like me to pay an early visit to Washington. We then began negotiations with the United States about when that could occur. The dates were arranged. Secondly, our largest trading partner, China, the date suggested by our friends in China was that uh, we needed to make sure that a visit was undertaken well short of the Olympics because there's going to be a crowd of visits as they got near to the Olympics. The third element in the equation was uh, a decision relating to our troops deployed in uh, Afghanistan. That goes to NATO's strategy for the deployment of troops in Afghanistan and the upcoming NATO summit, which is to be held in Bucharest. That has a, of a fixed date. That occurs early next month. If you put the three together, it defines the architecture of a visit abroad. That's why it's being undertaken. As for the final part of the, uh, the honourable member's question concerning our friends and partners in Japan. 
In the period the government has been in office, Japan has been uh, the kind host of visits by the foreign minister, uh, the trade minister, uh, the minister for industry, and um, one other minister as well that I can't quite recall. <laughs> and, uh, minister for industry and resources. There you go. It's fun. Four ministerial visits. Uh, I don't think that any of these ministers have yet travelled to China, actually. I might be wrong. Uh, the priority we attach to our relationship with Japan is underpinned by the fact that these ministers have seen our absolute necessity of uh, making early contact with their Japanese ministerial counterparts. Furthermore, the Japanese have been in contact with us over a long period of time about an invitation for me as Prime Minister to attend uh, the G8 meeting to be held in Tokyo in July. They have indicated that they want to have bilateral discussions and meetings with me on that occasion. And on, and on top of that, we are in continued negotiations and discussions about a further bilateral visit between ourselves, between myself to, uh, to, on the part of myself to Japan. Where does all this, uh, where does all this uh, uh, come together? We right now, if, uh, if uh, honourable members opposite have paid close attention to the state of the global economy, are travelling in uncertain economic times globally. It is of deep importance, therefore, that at the level of Prime Minister of Australia we have direct dealings with the Americans who are currently engaged in very difficult decisions concerning the, uh, the health and robustness and state of US financial markets and upcoming actions both by the US Treasury and the US Fed. Similarly, developments in the City of London affected by decisions undertaken by the Bank of, Lin L Bank of England are important in terms of our current global economic circumstances, as are the upcoming uh, economic developments in China, our principal trading partner, with whom we have a deep and vested interest to ensure that that export relationship is expanded further. It is because the economic interests of this nation are at the forefront of the government's attention that we have embarked upon this visit, and I am actually surprised that the Leader of the Opposition would choose on a, on a partisan nature to engage in an attack on it. The member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. And I ask, will the Minister update the House on the government's election commitments to develop a national child protection framework and related policies? The Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, honourable member for Macon uh, for his question uh, and his understanding that payments like the baby bonus are intended to serve the interests of children. And if that's not happening, uh, the government needs to act to make sure that it does. I just uh, wanted to draw the uh, House's attention, Mr. Speaker, to uh, what this caller had to say on the Alan Jones uh, program yesterday. They're talking about the baby bonus. I'm a recovered drug addict, this caller said. I exploited the system. It was heaven for me. With an extra $5,000 bonus, mate, and I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't spend one. I didn't spend one cent of the bonus. I just took it off my missus. He went on to say, I know hundreds of people who have no intention of getting work, who are on methadone and drugs and everything else, and it's heaven when they get the bonus. I don't see any new prams or extra clothes for the kids, mate. I'm telling you that right now. Appalling. Appalling that this misuse of government support is going on and it cannot be allowed to go on any further. So that's why, that's why this government is intent on delivering on our election commitments to make sure that payments like the baby bonus serve the interests of children and are not spent on gambling or drugs or alcohol. It's why we've already begun the work that's necessary to develop a national child protection framework. And one aspect of this national child protection framework will be to give uh, the state and territory child protection authorities the power to recommend to Centrelink that uh, pa family payments, including the baby bonus, are able to be income managed or quarantined so that those uh, payments are spent in the interests of children, are spent on things like food or rent or clothing for children, that they're not spent on drugs or gambling. I might say, Mr. Uh, Speaker, that most parents, of course, do the right thing 
most parents uh, spend uh, family payments or the bo baby bonus in the interests of children. Unfortunately, uh, some don't. Where parents are responsible, then of course uh, the baby bonus uh, will continue to be paid in the normal way. But where they're not responsible, where they neglect their children, it is time that we made some serious changes. Those changes, of course, are already underway in the Northern Territory. And uh, some of my first decisions, in fact, as, ministers, as minister was to in implement income management in a number of uh, Northern Territory communities. And these decisions mean that the baby bonus uh, is uh, quarantined. In fact, 100 per cent of the baby bonus uh, is income managed in these communities. Uh, we also have made a commitment uh, to income manage the baby bonus in the Cape York welfare trials, and the same will take place in the income management trials that we will undertake with the uh, Western Australian Government in the Kimberley. It is true, Mr Speaker, that uh, these are not easy decisions uh, to make, uh, but they are decisions that should be made to protect children. I might uh, remind members that the extension of income management uh, to these payments, uh, like the baby bonus, uh, would not have happened under the if the Howard government had uh, continued in office. Uh, they did uh, copy Labor's policy, the policy that we put forward in opposition, but unfortunately they did nothing to fund these measures. There was no money to fund them. A lot of talk, a lot of talk from the previous government even legislation passed, no money paid, uh, no put money put into the budget and no action to make sure that these uh, changes were made. This really is not uh, good enough, Mr Speaker. This government is getting on with the job, making sure that family ba uh, payments, including the baby bonus, are there to be spent in the interests of children, not squandered on drugs or gambling. Order the member for Warringah. Uh, on indulgence, Mr Speaker, I'd like to say that I thoroughly support uh, what the minister has said, and it does completely confirm the measures that were put in place Order. by the Howard government. Order. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, given the concerns held in Japan for a strong relationship with Australia, will the Prime Minister consider Order. dropping one of his four days in China during his imminent overseas trip and instead Order. spend a day in Order. Japan. Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I uh, begin my answer by repeating how I concluded uh, the last answer, which is that I am disappointed that the um, Leader of the Opposition, as the alternative Prime Minister of the country, would choose to be partisan on questions, no, questions which go to our principal foreign relationships. Uh, when it comes to the organisation of uh, itineraries with uh, foreign governments, uh, those of the United States, those of China, those of Japan, those of the United Kingdom and elsewhere, as the minister would know from his experience as a minister, as the Leader of the Opposition would know his experience as a minister, these are complex negotiations which involve complex questions of scheduling between multiple governments and, be and across multiple governments. Uh, when it comes to the visit to Japan, uh, already, dates are under discussion for a further visit on top of the July visit. Uh, I look forward very much to undertaking that visit to Tokyo. I visited Japan on a number of occasions in the past. It remains for us a principal, a principal economic and foreign policy partner for the future, and I look forward very much to visiting Tokyo. The member for Flynn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Minister, what is the greatest threat to certainty facing wheat growers with this year's harvest? Order. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Flynn for his question and note his strong interest in agricultural issues. Also acknowledge the the level of enthusiasm for the subject that's come, come from across the chamber. Uh, I've got to say, I thought there might have been a question from the other side about wheat on this issue. There's clearly a lot of passion coming through the papers, a lot of passion coming through the papers on this. But what we need to understand 
with the legislation that's to be dealt with and to be introduced in the budget sittings, what happens if nothing changes? What happens to certainty for wheat growers if that legislation does not go through? If nothing changes, the veto power on 30 June this year of the minister will disappear. That's what happens with the legislation that was left to this government. But the second thing that will happen is the protections growers will be exposed with no protections, no protections which would otherwise be provided by the legislation being brought through by the government. First of all, there would be no probity test, no probity test to make sure whether a buyer of wheat is actually in a financial position to carry out the purchase. And secondly, there would be no guaranteed access arrangements, no arrangements to make sure that we don't end up with monopoly situations being abused at the ports. So how can growers be given certainty? How can we make sure that we send a message, Mr Speaker, to growers that goes beyond the old National Party policy that says growers won't be allowed to choose who they sell their wheat to? Because that's the guts of the Nats policy on this. They won't allow growers to choose who they sell to. Well, certainty can be given very simply, and it's for, it's for the Leader of the Nationals, not in his role as the Leader of the Nationals, but in his role as a frontbencher for the coalition, as a frontbencher for the coalition, to actually declare a coalition position in support of reform of the current wheat arrangements. Now, there's a reason. There's a reason why he can't do that. And it's quite simple that the relationship between the Liberal Party and the National Party has entirely broken down. We had, we had on the 10th of March, we had the ma manager of opposition business in this House make a comment to the media where he said, and I quote, re referring to the Nationals, they have now lost their unique identification with the country. That was the position. And, and interestingly, interestingly, that's the position of the member for North Sydney. And I'll get to a moment to the affinity that North Sydney has with the Nationals. But before I get there, it was also put well today, put well today uh, by another, another Liberal, Liberal MP from out Goulburn Way who, used the, who made the comment, there's two options, the member for Hume, the Liberal Party can sit back and wait for them to die and contest their seats, or, or Order. the remnant... The Order. The, or the minister remnant. will resume his seat. The minister will resume his seat. The Member for Cowper. Mr. Speaker, it may come as some surprise to the minister, but the question was in relation to wheat marketing. Order. I draw your attention to the relevance Order. of his answer. The minister will return to the question. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The concern, the concern that we have is to make sure that we can provide growers with certainty. And the Senate numbers being what they are, certainty is only going to be provided by a unified coalition position. That is how certainty becomes possible to be given by the growers. And while the member for North Sydney clearly understands uh, the concerns and why that certainty is not being provided, the New South Wales Nationals at their next state conference are actually holding it in his seat. In his seat. That's the brochure for the next New South Wales conference of the National Party. They're going to be there at the Kirribilli Club. The Nationals, the party of the bush, now reverts to the Kirribilli Club as their place to meet. Order. The Minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, could you please ask Order. the Minister to come back to the substance Order. of the question? The, the Minister should Order. The Minister should refer more specifically to threats, <laughs> not to other business. The Leader the Minister. Mr Speaker, the threat of the legislation being defeated in the Senate by the coalition failing to have a unified position creates a real threat to every wheat grower in Australia. Because the situation will then arise, and I remind the Leader of the Nationals of comments he made in this House last week, where he objected, he objected to some of the approvals of permits which had been made, without recognising when I didn't exercise veto with respect to those permits, after the 30th of June my veto power is gone and they would have been automatically registered anyway. Those individual ones would have been automatically registered. The Nationals don't seem to understand the problem that the legislation that's currently in place faces. And you only have to walk past the office of the Leader of the Nationals, and you'll see his photo there in the corridors of Parliament. 
where it's, it's got the sign, it's got nationals, Order. deputy leader. Minister, we'll get back to the question. Order. The le well, deputy leader of the opposition with a point of order. Is on relevance. Yeah. Well, the Mr. minister Speaker. will get back to the question. Relevance of the net. And Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, the, well, I said deputy leader, and I should correct that. Leader of the Nationals. The word deputy's got green sticky tape oh, covered no, over it at the moment. But Mr. 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 Speaker, the, but Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, for wheat growers to be given certainty, it has to take into account the legislation that we currently face. The legislation that we currently face was given clear sunset provisions, which expire on the 30th of June. Any debate and the need to make sure we have sensible arrangements from the 1st of July onwards needs to take that into account. The member for Goldstein. Mr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister recall referring to Mr Ian Tang, the Chief Executive of Beijing AusChina Technology, as his Chinese controller? And that the PM went on to say, that the PM went on to say, and I quote: "In terms of detail, I'm not really across what he does." Prime Minister, who was at your post-election meeting with Mr. Tang? What day was that meeting held, and what was discussed? The Prime Minister. The um, uh, I have no such recollection, but um, maybe. But, uh, I have no such Order. collection other than it being some sort of humorous conversation. But, um, but uh, on, on the other question which Order. has been raised by the honourable member Order, the uh, concerning the meeting uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, November, December, I've answered that question earlier on. The member for Oxley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Resources and Energy. Uh, Minister, will you inform the House about the work of the Ministerial Council on energy and, in particular, the progress of the rollout of smart metres? The Minister for Resources and Energy. Order. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Oxley for this question, because he, like this side of the House, knows the importance of energy market reform. Energy market reform is clearly about micro-reform in Australia. But it's not just about the bottom line for consumers in the business community. It's also about us putting together a national energy market that is central to our ongoing debate about climate change in Australia. In that context, I'm pleased to say that the ministerial meeting was held in December of last year, less than two weeks after the appointment of the Rudd Labor government. And this important meeting was not only focused on further progress in microeconomic reform, actually putting together an ongoing process which guarantees proper attention reducing energy costs in Australia through the establishment and finalisation of our national gas laws, was also about locking in once and forever the establishment of the Australian energy market operator. In the context of this ongoing energy reform, can I also report to the House that following a cost-benefit analysis prepared by the Ministerial Council on Energy, we're now in the process of finalising not only the minimum functionality for smart meters, so as to guarantee the best possible consistency across all state and territory governments, but perhaps more importantly, state governments are now giving consideration to the commencement of the rollout of these smart meters. And this process is exceptionally important because the cost benefit analysis prepared for the ministers effectively says that the rollout of smart meters can effectively represent savings to the Australian economy as high as $4 billion. And when you think about the cost pressures on Australian consumers at the moment because of the failures of the other side of the House, one can understand that better consumer information on the use of energy can actually assist them in managing the pressures that they confront as ordinary households at the moment. It's about better education and opportunities to actually use energy more smartly. But it's also smart for business in Australia, because one of the biggest challenges to energy providers in Australia in terms of generation capacity is the pressure put on the Australian community in terms of peak power. It effectively means that at particular times of the year we have energy requirements far in excess of what is required for the greatest part of the year. By way of example, 
in some parts of the network, about 20 per cent of infrastructure capacity is used for less than 1 per cent of the year. So with growing demands for energy in Australia, if we can actually assist in rolling out smart meters and locking in once and for all the national energy market, we can take, off, pre take pressure off investors in Australia for additional energy capacity. So I simply say that in terms of the COAG process, which is about state and federal governments not only working together, but also work in cooperation with the private sector, the ongoing work of the Ministerial Council on Energy is exceptionally important. And I simply say in conclusion that we will commit in cooperation with the state and territory government and the private sector for putting in place these smart meters, because they are not only smart for consumers, they are good for industry and they are good for climate change and the ongoing requirement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. The member for Warringah. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the member claim to have been misrepresented? I do, Mr Speaker. In question the time for today, uh, the Minister for Housing uh, claimed that uh, I had criticised the Labor members for visiting homeless shelters. Uh, I did no such thing, and I challenged the minister to produce a transcript of the effect that I did. What I did say, Mr Speaker, was that it was one thing to visit these shelters, it was another thing to actually make right. a difference to the plight of right. homeless people, and I challenged the, the government has to get on with it. Explain where he's been receiving. The member for uh, Fisher. Uh, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the member claim to have been misrepresented? I do, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Order the member for Fisher. In today's Courier Mail, at page 10, there was a report on a speech given by the Leader of the Opposition at the National Press Club. And in that report, uh, it was written that I, along with a number of others, uh, were present. Uh, while uh, no inference should be made over the fact that I was absent, uh, I think that it Order. ought. Order. While Order. no inference. Uh, Order. No, while no inference uh, should be made over the fact I was not present, I want to correct the record and state that, despite what the Courier Mail said at page 10, I was not at the National Press Club yesterday. <laughs> The member for North Sydney. Mr. Order. Uh, the member for North Sydney has the call. Order. The member for North Sydney. I refer you to. Order. The Leader of the House. Member for North Sydney. Mr. Speaker, I refer you to House of Representatives practice and note. Uh, that the practice states that uh, in relation to answers to questions, there has been a tradition of this place uh, that either question time goes for a set period of time, normally to the point of 3.30, uh, or else, or th and the trade-off for that in having a set period of time for question time is that answers can go for so long as the uh, minister chooses. Now the alternative practice has been order. The, alter the alternative practice has been, uh, Mr. Speaker, that answers are of a limited duration, uh, limited duration, uh, and there is a set number of questions. Uh, I would ask you to report back to the House on what has been the set pr procedure over the length of question time in the last 20 years. Well, I, I, order. Order, I really do not atten intend to do that. If the, if the member wants the answer to those questions, he could go to chamber research. The, the, the thing is that, the, that um, if he reads practice, what he will find is that what happened today is what has happened for many, many years. It is in the hands of the Prime Minister when he asks that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. On a question to me, point of order. Question of, to you, Mr. The Leader of the House. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I refer you to uh, Standing Order 128, uh, which makes it clear that those members who call for a division must not leave the area of members' seats and they must vote with those members who, in the Speaker's opinion, were in the minority when the members called aye or no. Mr. Speaker, prior to uh, question time, uh, there were members of the opposition 
who called for a division and then left the chamber in breach of Standing Order 128. When this was raised with the Deputy Speaker, he indicated that he would refer the matter to you. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, clear breach of the obligations of members opposite, I would, uh, I would ask that you, uh, you, you consider uh, the matter and uh, report back to the House on what action you will take with regard to those members opposite who breach their obligations under standing orders. Order. Consistent with what I've been saying, it's not going to be my intention um, as the chair to review by way of video reference or whatever items that have occurred before. But if, I'm sure that if the member of the speaker's panel wants to have a discussion with me, about that matter or any of the other matters that in his nearly two hours in the chair he had to deal with. And might I say, not that I was able to observe the whole time, I thought that he did in a very efficient manner. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sometimes we just have to have a little bit of give and take. I'm sure that if the occupant of the chair didn't believe that he could uh, deal with the, the matter at the point in time, there was reasons for doing that. And that is likely where the matter will well, be left. The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, to be perfectly clear about it, Mr Speaker, uh, the government introduced a motion and they're attacking the opposition and then denied the opposition the, member for the right North to Sydney speak. Will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. Look, it's a very bold statement to say that I was uh, very pleased with the tranquility of question time. So much so that by the time we got to about the 21st question, I couldn't remember actually what it was to give a brilliant ruling on the uh, fact that the Minister for Agriculture, Fishes and Forestry was anywhere near his question. But having said that, I don't think that we should review what occurred around about lunchtime today. I think that we learn lessons from it. As I said, the main thing for me is that the occupant of the chair has my uh, faith in, the, in these actions that he, that he took, and I think that we should just move on with business of the House. Order. I am pleased to announce that Mr Alan Thompson has accepted an offer to take up the position of Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services. Mr Thompson has extensive leadership and policy experience at state, territory and national levels. He is currently the Secretary for the New Zealand Ministry of Transport, and in that role he is overseeing major changes to the New Zealand land transport sector's funding and organisational arrangements and developing a new transport strategy for New Zealand. He has served as Secretary of three Victorian government departments, Justice, Conservation and Natural Resources and Housing and Construction. Mr Thompson was also Chief Executive of the ACT Department of Urban Services from 1999 to 2004. In 2003, he was seconded to lead the Canberra bushfire recovery team. Mr Thompson was selected in an open and transparent merit-based process from a strong field. His appointment will be for a period of five years, commencing in May 2008. He replaces former Secretary Hilary Penfold, QC, who has recently been appointed as a judge the ACT Supreme Court. The Deputy Secretary of, the, of DPS, Mr David Kenny, will continue to act as Secretary until Mr Thompson's arrival. The Leader of the House. Thanks, Mr Speaker. Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today.